Hello everyone and welcome to our next talk which is um, mine. Uh, to introduce myself, which is wrong, um, I did a postdoc in machine learning after getting my PhD in algebraic topology with uh, some of the people who did some of the math behind um, the concepts in this talk and I've just extended it for this thing. So um, that's enough about me. Uh, let me play my talk back for you. So here. Uh, welcome everyone to my talk on calculating concept drift very quickly with this library called Gorkle, which is based on coverage trees. I hear no audio. Oopsie daisy. Oopsie daisy. Um, there's no do you hear audio from the talk? Um, there's no do you hear audio from the talk? Okay, well that's the problem I'm trying to... Uh, sorry about this guys. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. Um, I am up, I'll apologize. I am up, I apologize. I am the key takeaway for this talk is this is a novel uh, way of calculating drift. Uh, welcome everyone to my talk on calculating concept drift very quickly with this library called Gorkle, which is based on coverage trees. Um, my name is Sven Cattell. I am a senior data scientist at Elastic. And my Twitter handle is co-mathematician. So uh, the key outline, for, key takeaway for this talk is this is a novel uh, way of calculating drift. It's done uh, using a uh, new technique using cover trees. Um, and because it's so fast, it's uh, log n time to actually calculate uh, drift for a new sample. Uh, we can use it for on in new ways that concept drift couldn't have been applied before now. So we're going to go with the objective, why we care about concept drift, how, mathematically how it's done, then a couple of results, and then finishing up with next steps. So why do we care about data set drifts? Well, our data uh, drifts. Um, so you know, for, I work with malware, and there are new malware families coming out every month. There are new benign pieces of examples of software coming out every month. Every time that Adobe patches Photoshop, it changes the pattern slightly and it changes its location slightly in our data set. Uh, every single time a new piece of malware comes up, it's a new p it changes our, the way our the malware data is distributed slightly. 
Another problem, um, what, well, what those do basically, which gets into the second problem, is they lower the efficacy of our models that we deploy. Um, so our models expect data in a sort of sort of the same sort of general location as our training data. And every time we deploy, we are kind of fixing our models view of the world at a certain day, and then we're view training it and we're testing it on essentially future data. So it doesn't have a perspective um, for the, you know, if it's trained in March, it doesn't have its perspective, it might not work very well on the end data coming in at the end of April. Um, so one of the methods for dealing with this is you build a dashboard that basically tracks the error. Um, and when the error gets too high, you discard the model and go on for a new one. But the problem is I don't trust virus total labels and I don't think anyone really should trust virus total labels. And that's the best way we have because of the sheer volume of data, we have to try to trust virus total labels. So, um, and for other things, I wouldn't trust early labels on, uh, on data because we have to move very quickly and sometimes with whitelisting and stuff. Um, and you know, well, and sometimes we only get like a label when our customer complains and we'd rather get ahead of that and figure out like, hey, where's the drift happening? What's going on? And then additionally, aside from the fact that things are just changing all the time, our models are also under attack. People are trying to bypass them by doing new and weird things to the data, like packing a spam filter so um, and seeing if that works, or like posting a different pattern so that to see if that works, to see if they can get past like the Facebook spam filter. And they're constantly innovating with a specific goal in mind of bypassing our spam our models. Um, this may not result be an adversarial example per se from the literature, but it sure kind of acts like that sometimes. And um, additionally, we could be under attack via our poisoning system. Maybe if the uh, detector is fast enough, we could get ahead of those things beforehand. So here's a trivial example. Um, so we have these two data sets. So one is our training data set. That's so we got uh, one, one, two, one, one. And so our training data set has 70% ones, 20% twos, and 10% threes. Um, and this is what we trained on. Um, Realistically, there's no point in training a, mo a machine learning model on a, a sequence of numbers, but suppose we do. Um, but then we deploy this model and we get this other sequence of data, two, two, one, two, so on, so on. And our, when we actually deploy it, we see data coming over the wire. We have 30% ones, 60% twos, and 10% threes. So that's a little bit different from our training set. So the real world is different from our training set. So in this case, this is a we can model this distribution very easily because it's a discrete space. There are only three things that our data could be. There's only um, so it isn't continuous like a lot of the, of the stuff we have to deal with in data science. So we can actually compute the distribution fairly easily, and this is a pretty good that we can feel confident in our estimate of the distribution. Uh, we have to do some Bayesian statistics to do this properly. Um, which we're not getting into this talk, but um, this is basically how it works. And then once we have like a concept of our training distribution and our uh, real world distribution or our test distribution, as I'll be calling it to this uh, today, we can take the um, kublai leftrich divergence. So this is um, a sort of a measure of the distance between this distribution and this distribution. And it's very easy to calculate on this categorical discrete uh, data because it's just going to be, well, 0.7 times log of 0.7 over 0.3. So that's the category for ones over the categories of ones. Um, take the log and then multiply it for the category for ones. And that gives you the first term. Second term is the same thing for twos. And the third term is the same thing for threes. And then you add those all up and you get the, the KL divergence between these two distributions is 0.16. So that's all great. But the problem is our data looks like this. Um, and I don't know whether this is a, has any difference. Is, are, are these two, are my blue points sampled from the same distribution as my orange points? Um, I don't know. Uh, it's really hard to tell by just looking at this picture. Um, and now in this case, they are. So my orange points are sampled from a two-dimensional Gaussian, two-dimensional normal um, distribution, um, 
where it's just it's it's a nice sphere and the you know, they're both the the covariance matrix is one one and the covariance matrix with the blues is one one and it gives you this nice distribution and it looks okay now what I'm going to do is I'm going to drift the uh, blues slightly over and can you tell is this correct well you know every single time that I put a blue is it's right next to some orange points so this looks like it could be from the same distribution. I can't really tell with my eyes and one of the techniques we might do is like oh well I'm going to take the k nearest neighbors and see if the if the distance from my k nearest neighbors over time goes up and then I'm out of distribution but if you tell here that's not going to tell you much. If I go here well oh I've got some outliers here now so maybe that will work now. If I go here well this is really distributed so this center the center of this distribution should be around here and the center for this distribution is around here so that's really drifted. But you've got some outliers over here. Now what happens when there's like millions of orange points and there's only a few hundred blue points? Well you might not be able to tell the difference with that in that case. So and also like there's all this what I've described to you is kind of a feeling and to actually get at the math of this thing I have to like model the distributions that these came from and that's quite a hard problem and especially in high dimensions so things get kind of complicated. The solution to this that I came up with is to use a cover tree. Now, why do I want to use a cover tree? So, the cover tree basically, the, the key takeaway for cover trees is uh, it's a K nearest neighbors data structure. There are many like it. There's KD trees, there's B trees, there's um, KD trees, um, uh, you know, um, there's uh, K means trees, a whole bunch. And, uh, well, the cover tree has this wonderful thing where uh, in 2016 uh, Mario Majoni and Wenjing Lao proved that it can arbitrarily well approximate the underlying distribution of the data. Um, there's some caveats to that statement and mathematically it will prob to properly statement it will take, it, uh, take the whole page but basically the core concept of their proof is for a nice data set um, and to know what a nice data set is you need to know what a low dimensional manifold is um, and you have to have enough data from that um, but for a nice data set, which most of our data sets are pretty nice, um, sort of, kind of, a cover tree will arbitrarily well approximate the underlying distribution of the data. Um, there's some caveats, and you can go read their paper if you want on exactly what that means. But for us, what this means is if I use a cover tree to build a model of my data for k nearest neighbors, I can take k nearest neighbors. Or I can just fiddle around with the, the properties of the cover tree to like get information about my data set out. So I can tell things like the local dimensionality, I can tell things like how things glue together, um, and I can tell like sort of the shape of my data fairly well. I can tell clusters and things, I, I can uh, infer what clusters are. So let's go build a very simple cover tree on two-dimensional data. So here's a uh, you know infinity sign, um, a bow tie, whatever you want to call it. And I start my cover tree by picking a point at random and then building a sphere, uh, you know, uh, in this case it's a circle, that covers everything. So this is the start. Um, and now this doesn't help me that much. I haven't split up my data geometrically to like divide and conquer the k nearest neighbors um, structure. Because the naive way would take uh, a linear time, the big O of n, but we want to divide and conquer so it takes log of n. So here's what I do. I shrink my sphere down, add another one, and I, co I cover it again. You can kind of tell that this, this object is longer than it is wide. So it's kind of, if you really squint, it's kind of one dimensional thing in this direction. Um, so that's great. But now if I go, okay, well, I'm going to split it up further. So I'm really good divide and conquer. And I, so I've got these two nodes and they're both children of the previous node on the previous slide. And I'm going to build their children. So here's their children. So I divide and conquer the, the, their stuff, um, and I can kind of tell that the, each of their children have four. And if I if you squint a little bit, it's kind of square shaped in this dimension at the scale. At the top scale, it was too blurry; I could only see a line here. At the scale, I can kind of see that it's up and it's got a nice shape, square shape. Um, and so there's four children, and the reason you know that that that, that dimensionality has relevant to the number of children you have. And then I can go further and you know it's got some more, it's kind of split up nicely and I've got like a one-dimensional object here again because that all these children are kind of one-dimensional-ish. And I can split up some more and you can see that it's kind of like conforming to your data nicely and like 
At every single step of the way, I can make some inferences about what sh the sh shape of my data is that are very cheap because it's basically counting. So how do we build a probability distribution? So on slide two, we built a very simple a probability distribution where I had um, a discrete space. And now I've got a tree. And essentially, when I have a tree at every single node, I can either go left or right or down, or you know, in this case, my number of children I have is, um, is uh, variable. Um, but I will be at a, a parent node and I have to go to one of its children. So I always have um, a discrete choices, a discrete choice of where to go. So how does that apply? Uh, so here is a very like simple cover tree, um, and I've colored it by the the total like the, the, the population of this node. So the, this color here is the popul relative population of this node. So uh, about sixty six percent of the da data is underneath this node. About thirty three percent of the data is underneath this node, and you can see that the colors are kind of change, and I get a a kind of a picture of how dense my data is, but that doesn't help me because I need to make choice. Uh, it doesn't help me make the choices at all the steps. So if I go here, this helps me make my choices. So here I've got 66% of my data over here, and I've got 33% um, of my data over here. And then once I take, if I, I have to take one of those two choices, if I take this choice, I'm now at this node. And I have two choices again. And the relative probability of taking this choice versus this one, well, this is basically a tro uh, point 0.1 probability of taking this, this path. And this is a point 0.9 probability of taking this path. And once I get to this node, uh, I have a probability of one of going straight down because I have no other choices. And at every single point, I have a discrete distribution like we had on, on page one, which tells me where I'm going. And because my tree is geometrically motivated, these choices, which are all discrete and easy to compute and easy to count and easy to keep track of, um, now can, I can compute the KL divergence because it's, it's trivial. It's, it's, all, it's just counting and taking logs and uh, uh, summing things up. So this is my um, prior distribution. As I said, we're going to use some Bayesian statistics. And so here is my prior. How this is built of my training set. How do I include uh, my test set? Um, so when I see a piece of data coming over the wire, I can make an inference of where it should be long in this tree. So if it was already, if it was in my training set and didn't get involved in building the tree, where would have it ended up? So I have a point here. So this is my new point that came over the wire. And I queried and said, oh, well, this point is covered by this parent and it's covered by that parent and that parent and all the way up. So the path for this point goes up this way. And now for each of those elements in those paths, I can increment my probability distribution and get a posterior one that, involve, that includes the new information that I got, that there is a new point over here. And now I can do that again with another point. Oh, yep, cool, I have a posterior, uh, this point's been added and you can see that the distribution changes. And then I can add some more points and I can add some more points. So these are all my posterior, and I can update my original thing by taking the path of each of the points and updating all the little discrete distributions that I have. So this enables me to sort of quickly uh, make a posterior distribution out of my prior distribution, and everything is, is discrete. Uh, and then I can take the KL divergence between my posterior uh, discrete distributions and my prior discrete distributions. So in this case, this one has a probability of 0.33, and here I have a probability of 0.66. And afterwards, after I've included all my training set, this is a probability of like 0.4, and this you know this is a probability of 0.6, and this is a probability of 0.4. And those are very different, and I can plug those into the KL divergence thing and get a positive number for the KL divergence at this node, and then I can do it for this node and this node, and this node, and get all of the KL divergences and add them up. And then I can get the total KL, the KL divergence with respect to my original tree of the posterior distribution with respect to the prior distribution, which is really useful. And so this basically, yeah, uh, does it. Um, and it's 
the, the code for doing this um, enables you to do it uh, very quickly because it's basically just counting um, and a couple logs and some other uh, statistical equations. <coughs> um, and the slide just covers how you do it. So um, let's go back to that original test set. Um, so I've got a, basically a blown up version of the those slides of the Gaussian distributions where I had them, where a large number of points from my training distribution, which was a single Gaussian sample that the center of the thing. And then I have a small number of points uh, from a test distribution. Um, and in this case, I have 100,000 points from my training distribution and only 500 points from my a test distribution. And these both have a um, covariance matrix of all ones. So it's actually quite, uh, and it's 20 dimensional. So this is actually harder than most data sets. Uh, MNIST is about 10 dimensional if you really get down to it. If you want to know what that is, you can contact me on Twitter and ask me why MNIST might be uh, lower dimensional. Um, and between the training distribution, I build the tree, fix it, and then I make a posterior distribution for a bunch of test distributions. I take the KL divergence. And you can see it's a bit noisy. Um, the reason being is I generate a lot of uh, the exact position of your points. It's fairly sensitive to use. Um, so this is one of the problems and one of the things I'll talk about at the end is like, there are ways to normalize this and resolve this because I've designed it for speed, not really for accuracy, um, and I'll get into why I did that afterwards. Because honestly, I came for, it came to the drift stuff backwards. But you can see, the further you get, the further you separate the two uh, distributions, the uh, higher the number gets. So the sanity test, the unit test of does this work, is correct. Um, and now to compare this to other methods, um, this takes big O of uh, and oh, sorry, Wasserstein takes big O of n to the fourth. Um, that Wasserstein is the only other um, drift calculator that I really know works uh, and is model independent and doesn't have um, some funny business with building an estimated distribution initially. Um, this takes um, k log n. Another big difference between Wasserstein is the traditional way of doing Wasserstein requires a relatively equal size test and training set. Um, you can't have the test set be 0.5% uh, of the training set. That would just would not work so great on the traditional method I know of. Um, and this one, honestly, it's online. You can do, the test set can be a fraction of the size of the training set. And because it's online, it can do it in real time. Um, and this is stupidly fast. You can track for uh, the Ember open source Ember malware data set. Um, you build a reasonable cover tree. You can track 16,000 new samples per second on my laptop. Um, so that's fast enough that inference wouldn't be, this This would not be the bottleneck. Inference would be the bottleneck if you would distribute, uh, build a cloud distribution, a cloud model, and put this as a guard in front of that cloud model. So we've built it so that it can go fast enough to defend. And now here is where the, the, the thing originally came from, and then we backtracked onto drift. So here's the test set attack. Um, so this was originally um, categorized by Ian Goodfellow, um, and there's some defenses have been proposed by um, Nicholas Carlini uh, and others. Um, so, but here is the gist of the attack. Normal users just query. They don't care about whether they got a false positive or a false negative. They just keep querying. Um, and for us, we'll th we think of a normal user as being like an enterprise user trying to figure out whether all the reports coming over the wire of like new bi binaries are malicious or benign, or they'd be submitting every single binary that they see on their network to a service um, or their um, or, or you know that will tell them whether it was malicious or benign for an AV pro uh, you know in an ADV product. <clears throat> but a malicious user would be submitting things with a specific goal in mind. They don't care about what, the, they care deeply what the label is, and they de care deeply about get finding a false negative. They want to find a malicious sample we classify as benign. So what they'll do is they'll try a bunch of stuff until they find something 
um, that is misclassified as benign and is actually malicious and bypasses our model and then we can and then they deploy it um, as far as much as possible so um, if you do if you apply this to you know the the fast drift calculators to that you can attach a little drift calculator to each user and as samples come over the wire you track it for that user um, and if the user starts exploiting something they're going to get a very boring distribution where it's just one point repeated over and over again um, and you spike your distribution your KL divergence spikes up and then becomes very normal because it's essentially you're tracing the same path over and over and over again um, and you can see that there's an exploration phase where the malicious users try to look for a benign uh, uh, misclassified sample and then they when they find one there's an exploitation phase and the KL divergence rises rapidly you can see that also that this is in log scale so this is literally hundreds of times more kale divergence than the benign samples and here there it's the same thing hundreds of times more kale divergence than the benign and the attackers who were unsuccessful uh, because of this you can build you could probably build a very good online defense of your system against a tested attack um, so and here's where basically the yeah the, the the system was originally built sort of with this in mind and other attacks in mind because I'm more interested in defending my models than ac calculating drift. But because it's so bloody fast, it does this really well, and because it's so bloody fast, you can retrofit it. So uh, and here's you know here's where I'll talk about some next steps. So as I mentioned previously this thing is a bit noisy uh, there are ways to fix it um, in this case um, window sizes and like some tuning things that um, I didn't go into on the, in these slides because I've already got 20 minutes um, there are some tuning systems you can use to really clean up um, and denoise uh, there's also some interesting weighting functions you can do inside the tree because there will be there's some noise from like an overactive um, uh, uh, leaf node might end up just building a very high kale divergence for that just that one node and it throws everything off um, and there's a couple other little things like that that still need to be cleaned up before this goes into production but the system itself is looking very promising um, and is honestly the fastest of its kind um, that I've, I can see in the world and that's basically it for, uh, for Gokul's uh, uh, ability to detect benign, uh, you know, test set attacks and other drift things. Uh, the library is at elastic.com, oh, sorry, github slash elastic slash gorkel. It's named after my grandmother because the uh, the base algorithm for this thing is called GRMA, and if you say that while well, drunk, you can kind of get grandma. Um, and grandma's a bit or two on the nose, so we named it, I, uh, we, I named it gorkel. Um, anyway, well, looking forward to hearing you guys on Twitter and Twitch and Slack or whatever. So thank you very much and good night.